Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for the first day of our third-party risk management boot camp. We are excited to have you join us around the campfire over the next three days. We are going to go on a virtual camping trip to discuss important third-party risk management topics. My name is Jesse Redman, and I will be your host. On your screen, you should see multiple widgets that you can use. If you are not familiar with our webinars, all the widget boxes are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to maximize your screen space. At the bottom of your screen in the toolbar are icon buttons you can use to show and hide the widgets. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner of the widget. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Ask Question widget. Don't worry, we do capture all questions throughout each session. We will be answering some during the webcast, but those that we do not have a chance to answer live, we will address with you via email. In the related content widget, you will see a link to a copy of today's slide deck, a link to our website, a link to our samples library, a link to our resources library, which has hundreds of educational resources, and links to several specific resources that we feel will be helpful if you'd like to learn more about certain topics discussed today. You will notice underneath the slide area and next to the related content widget is a graphic showing the third-party risk management life cycle. This will be helpful to reference throughout the next three days as our sessions will be covering important steps through the entire life cycle. This three-day boot camp is eligible to earn up to six CPE credits, one for each of the six live sessions, so two credits per day. If you wish to receive these credits, please remember to answer all of the polling questions that will appear on your screen during each session's presentations. You will also be sent a follow-up survey link 24 hours after the boot camp has concluded on Friday, September 22nd, that will need to be completed in order to receive the CPE credit. Before we get started, let's go through introductions of our speakers for this three-day boot camp. Day one of the boot camp will kick off with FinMinder's Hilary Dewhurst, who is head of third-party risk education and advocacy, and will discuss inherent risk versus residual vendor risk. After that, Greg Cameron, VinMinder's Head of Third-Party Risk Advisory, will discuss steps and strategies for vendor due diligence. Tomorrow, on day two of the boot camp, VinMinder's President Kelly Vick will join us to discuss an overview of critical vendors and fourth parties within contracts. Then Lisa Mayhill, VinMinder's Information Security Operations Director, will walk us through mitigating supply chain risk through business continuity and third-party risk management, followed by an understanding of vendor data breaches, and wrapping up day two with discussing what you need to know about vendor SOC reports and complementary user entity controls. On Thursday, the last day of the boot camp, Hilary Dewhurst, VinMinder's Head of Third-Party Risk Education and Advocacy, will discuss a very timely topic the new interagency guidance on third-party relationships risk management. Then Raman Zachariah, VinMinder's Chief Financial Officer, will join us to discuss your vendor's financial health in today's business climate. Next, Jill Sherman, VinMinder's third-party risk principal, will walk us through the importance of vendor performance management. And after Jill, Hilary Dewhurst will join us again to wrap up the boot camp with an overview of program metrics and reporting in third-party risk management. Let's dive into the first hour with Hilary Dewhurst, covering the basics of what you need to know when it comes to inherent risk versus residual vendor risk. This comes into play in both the onboarding and ongoing stages of the third-party risk management lifecycle. With all that being said, I would like to hand it over to Hilary. Hilary, the floor is yours. Well, welcome everyone to our first session of Boot Camp. Today we are going to start off with a really important and fundamental part of third-party risk management, and that is understanding inherent and residual risk. We're going to start off with talking about the difference between the two, 
what types of risk you might identify, how we determine if a product or service is critical or not. We're going to get into controls a little bit, and then how to apply these concepts within your program. Then we're going to wrap up with some key takeaways. So let's jump right in. All right, to get started, you've probably noticed a graphic on your console that represents the third-party risk management lifecycle. Now, one of the reasons that we're opening our sessions today with inherent risk is that understanding and planning for the risk of the relationship is one of the very first things that we need to do, not only just to follow that third-party risk management lifecycle, but to really establish the boundaries and guidelines of that vendor relationship. So during the initial stages, we go through something called planning, which is where we're preparing ourselves to manage that relationship throughout its lifetime. And as a really important part of that, we have to identify all of the risks associated with that product or service and the relationship with the vendor. We also have to determine if this particular relationship is going to be critical to our operations or to our customers. So when we talk about risk, let's define what we're talking about. So risk is basically exposing someone or something valued to danger, harm, or loss. And the truth is that all vendor relationships have at least some risk. That risk is known as inherent risk. And it's the inherent risk that occurs within that product or service naturally. A quick example would be any vendor that requires the use of sensitive data to deliver their product or service, there is always a risk that that data could be compromised. Now, it's really important when we're talking about inherent risk that we're always thinking about that base risk or that raw risk. We're not thinking about all the things we can do to control or reduce that risk. That's what we mean by inherent risk. And we measure or rate the risk, usually on a scale of low, moderate, or high. Now the next thing we need to consider is how critical that product or service is going to be to our operations. That means we're thinking about the impact to our organization or to our customers should that vendor fail or go out of business. So anything that's necessary to sustain our core operations interface with our customers, or maintain regulatory compliance would be a critical product or service. And we need to identify every vendor engagement is either critical or non-critical. That brings us to residual risk. Now, residual risk is the measurement of risk that exists after we've applied our controls, or it's really the leftover risk. Residual risk is an important concept because there's no way to eliminate all of your risk. It's just not possible. I mean, I guess the only way you could eliminate vendor risk is not to have vendors at all, but that's really not a practical solution. So we have inherent risk, which is that risk that occurs naturally with the product or service, and we have criticality, which considers the business impact should that vendor fail, and we have residual risk, which measures the leftover risk after we've applied controls. So let's take a look at how to integrate each of these concepts as part of third-party risk management. So let's start off with inherent risk. So what is it? How do we use it? Well, the first thing to understand, like I mentioned, is it's present in every vendor relationship to some degree. And when we're thinking about that risk, we're always identifying and measuring the amount of risk that naturally occurs. Again, we're not thinking about any potential processes or tools or controls that we can use to reduce that risk because inherent risk is exactly that. It's the raw or untreated risk. Now, the best way to identify and measure these risks is through a formal and standardized inherent risk assessment. That inherent risk assessment is always in the internal document and should be completed by the vendor owner or the individual in the organization who wants to engage that vendor to provide products and services. So inherent risk assessments are never completed by the vendor. Now later in the process, we will ask the vendor to provide some information in the form of a vendor risk questionnaire, and that's part of our due diligence process. But the inherent risk assessments are always an internal document. 
All right, so what types of risks are we typically looking for through that inherent risk assessment? Well, this is a list of the most common vendor-related risks, and we're not going to go through all of them, but I do want to highlight just a few. So there's operational risk, which can be very broad. It can be internal or it can be external, and it refers to the vendor's own ineffective, failed processes, people, controls, or systems. So the vendor doesn't do something right, and it impacts our operations. But it also can be external, and it can be related to outside events like natural disasters, terrorist attacks, you know, severe weather events even uh, changes in consumer behaviors. There's business continuity risk, which is technically a subset of operational risk, which is a specific risk that a vendor won't be able to maintain normal operations after a business interrupting event. There's compliance risk, which stems from a vendor's failure to comply with any laws or regulations specific to those products or services, or the industry, or the products and services you're providing your customers. There's information security risk. This is all things cyber related. And this is the risk of cyber attacks, data breaches, that really stem from missing or ineffective information security protection and control. There's financial risk, which is the risk that the vendor's financial health is in decline or unstable, and therefore they wouldn't really be able to continue to provide you products and services um, per their contract. There's geographical risk, which is something we need to consider anytime we're doing business outside the United States. We may have a vendor who is located doing, doing business in a country that's vulnerable to corruption. Maybe there's some political unrest you know, very destabilized currency, et cetera. There's transaction risk, which is whenever a vendor is processing a financial transaction on your behalf, so you're taking credit card payments, et cetera, if this is not handled properly, it can really negatively impact your organization and your customers. And then there's also strategic risk, which is the risk that the actions and behaviors of the vendors are just not really compatible with your organization's strategies and goals. There's more risks, of course. Um, these are just some of the more common ones, but hopefully this gives you an example of the types of things you'd be looking for. Now, we talked about an inherent risk assessment, but really what should that look like? Well, here are some examples of the types of questions that we would ask on an inherent risk assessment, remember the vendor owner is going to be the one answering them because in theory, they know the most about the product and service we're wanting to bring on. A couple of things to keep in mind about your risk assessment is that it's usually a shorter questionnaire and we're really just trying to identify the specific risk areas that we need to investigate and understand. And we want to understand how much of that risk is present in the relationship. So for example, for reputational risk, we'd want to ask if the product or service would impact our clients or is the vendor interacting directly with our clients. For operational, we might ask if there is sensitive data being used or if that vendor needs unescorted access to our facilities. For transactional, we want to just identify if they are actually processing financial transactions on your behalf, and do they have any uh, PCI certification, that kind of thing. With compliance, we want to know if we need to rely on that product or service to maintain compliance with any regulatory guidance or law, and if this is a significantly regulated product or service. Uh, debt collection might be a good example. In business continuity, we want to understand if a disruption in service would cause a material impact to our organization or to that of our clients and customers. And then with cybersecurity, we would ask questions like if it's a technology-related service or does the vendor need to have access to our network or our data. Now, of course, there's many kinds of questions you can ask, but hopefully this will give you an idea of just kind of the short and simple questions that we're asking to help us identify where we have risk in that relationship.
When we're done with that particular questionnaire, it should result in a risk rating or score. So the best practice for this is to use a system of low, moderate, or high risk. Now, if your organization's using something different, that's okay, as long as you can articulate the differences between those risk levels and clearly identify what a different risk level would mean in terms of managing that relationship. We also need to understand that the risks that we're identifying are at this point almost vendor agnostic, right? We're really mostly looking at the product and service. And that risk rating that we use to get to that score, that should be standardized methodology. It should be documented somewhere. So every time we answer the questionnaire, we're going to get the same result. It's important to understand that critical should not be used as a risk rating, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But we also need to understand that risk is not a static thing and that we do need to periodically reevaluate and reassess the risk in our relationships. So now we've completed the inherent risk assessment and we have our risk rating. So what do we do with that rating once we've established it? Well, first of all, keep in mind that these risk ratings are really another tool to help your organization identify and prioritize those vendor engagements and relationships that are going to need the most attention and rigor. So, for example, your high risk, your critical relationships, they're always going to need more due diligence, more thorough monitoring, different kinds of contract structures, et cetera. And that's why we also use the risk ratings to help us establish what the specific routines are. We always base the frequency and the intensity of any third-party risk management requirement on that inherent risk rating. And then finally, our auditors and regulators expect that we're going to have an inherent risk rating for all vendors and all engagements. So making sure that we complete this process provides great evidence in the event of a regulatory audit or exam. Now, while you think about that, it is time for our first poll. Jesse? And this brings us to the first poll question of the boot camp. You should see the poll question now in the slides area. If you have any issues, please feel free to send us a message using the Ask Question widget, and we will be happy to assist. Please remember, if you wish to receive the CPE credit for today's session, you must answer all poll questions and be in attendance for the entire live session. The first question is, does your organization require an inherent risk assessment for every vendor engagement at the product or service level? Yes, no, or you're unsure? Hillary, we have some time now to answer one of the questions that has come in from the audience. Okay. And that question is, from a regulatory perspective, do we have to do all the activities and all three life stages? Uh, the short answer is yes. Now, keep in mind that that life cycle has been designed to essentially be the roadmap for kind of safe and sound operation for your third-party risk management program. What is important to remember, though, is just like everything in third-party risk management, it should be risk-based. So that means you're not doing the same level of you know, due diligence or the same kind of intensive risk management activities for every engagement. So basically, we want to start at that beginning and really just go through each activity and do what is necessary to match the risk of the engagement. But yes, we really do need to fulfill all the activities in all three stages to meet regulatory requirements and just as a best practice. Um, I hope that helps. Thanks, everyone, for answering that poll question. Here are those results. By the way, you may have noticed reactions, such as a thumbs up or heart coming across the screen. If you find this feature distracting, you can turn it off by clicking the four arrows in the top right-hand corner of the slide widget, which will expand the slides to full screen and no longer show the reactions. Also, before we move on in the related content widget, you'll find our The Process of Inherent to Residual Vendor Risk Infographic. 
This is a great infographic to reference as it shows the visual process of inherent to residual vendor risk. Back to you, Hillary. Now let's talk about criticality for a moment because the next important piece of information that we need to know is whether each vendor is critical or non-critical for our organization's operations or to our customers. And so in order to determine the level of importance, there are three critical questions that we usually ask. If you answer positively to any of these questions, it's likely that you're dealing with a critical vendor. So those questions are, would a sudden loss of this vendor cause a disruption to our organization? Would that disruption impact our customers? And if the time for the vendor to recover their operations is more than 24 hours, is there going to be a negative impact to our organization? So again, if you answer yes to any of those questions, you're probably dealing with a critical vendor. It's really important to identify this specific group of vendors for a number of important reasons. Apart from being the backbone of our operations, there are a lot of expectations regarding critical vendors. So let's take a look at some of those. So to begin with, your critical vendors have to go through the most thorough due diligence, risk assessment, performance management, and monitoring. And we have to be able to provide evidence of these practices because it's really important to stay vigilant about the potential risk associated with our critical vendors by regularly reassessing and updating due diligence and keeping our eye on the relationship in general. To ensure this, we conduct a reassessment and due diligence refresh on a minimum basis of annually, right? It's important also for senior management and the board to have visibility over those critical vendors and to be attentive to their performance, especially when we're renewing contracts or dealing with any issues. As critical vendors play such an important role in our operations, it's vital that we include them in our internal business continuity and resiliency planning. And finally, it's really important to note that critical vendors are always going to be included in the scope of review by auditors and your regulatory examiners. All right, to recap a little bit about what we've learned about risk versus criticality, first of all, criticality speaks to business impact. It is not a risk rating, right? We use the label critical to identify that smaller subset of vendors that are absolutely essential to your operation or to your customers, whether that's to keep the doors open or to help you satisfy regulatory requirements. We need to know who those missing critical vendors are. All vendors and all vendor engagements should be identified as either critical or non-critical, okay? Now, when it comes to inherent risk ratings, these are the scores or the ratings that help us identify both the types and amounts of risks present in the engagement. And they're an aggregate, right? So whereas you may have high compliance risk but and high cybersecurity risk, maybe you have lower financial risk or lower concentration risk, the overall score will probably be high risk in that case. So we, we're really looking at a cumulative score that considers all the types and risk present in that engagement. And remember, as a best practice, we have very simple, easy to use risk scales, low, moderate, high. Again, if your organization is doing something different, that's fine as long as you can articulate it and justify it and clearly define the difference between those risk levels. Keep in mind, every vendor engagement needs these two pieces of information to get started. If they're critical or non-critical, and their risk rating. Now, once you have those two pieces of information, you can start scoping your due diligence. 
Now, keep in mind, we are going to have a whole session around due diligence, so we won't get into the weeds during this session. But just as a general overview, due diligence is an essential part of risk assessment and management. And it usually involves the following. So we have a risk rating, we know if they're critical, and we send a questionnaire to the vendor asking very detailed questions about their internal risk management practices and controls. So the vendor completes that questionnaire. We also ask the vendor to return documented evidence of those risk management practices and controls. So these are all the due diligence documents that you hear about. Once those are collected, we have a subject matter expert review and assess the information provided by the vendor and validate the sufficiency of those controls. Now, due diligence must always be completed before you can determine if you need any risk handling techniques and what the residual risk of the engagement is. Okay, on the previous slide, I mentioned something called a risk handling technique. You might be wondering what the heck that is, but it's just a very elegant way of saying how we handle and manage risk. So there's basically four ways any organization can handle risk. The first one is to accept the risk which means we know what it is, we're okay with it, we're going to accept the risk. The next one is to transfer. Now, let's be clear, this is only about insuring against loss by transferring financial liability to another party like an insurer or back to the vendor. We're always responsible for all of the risks associated with the engagement. So this is really about insuring against loss. We can just avoid the risk altogether, just don't do it, don't engage. But the most popular and most common way to handle risk is to mitigate it or implement controls. Now we'll get into each of these um, on the following slide, so let's jump in. Now let's start with kind of the two extremes, the two ends of the spectrum. The first one is just to avoid the risk altogether, just don't do it. Now, the only way to avoid all vendor risk is avoid all outsourcing and using vendors, which is really not a practical solution. Um, but there are some risks we may want to avoid, especially when the benefits don't outweigh the risk and it's not within our risk appetite. But there's other ways that we can avoid risk, like not sending more data than we need to or managing who can access you know, certain information. On the other end of the spectrum, we have accept the risk, which means we understand what the risk is, it is what it is, we're okay with it, we're going to formally accept the risk. Now, when risk is accepted, it's a really good practice to have a standard and formalized process to do that, especially if the risk is can be perceived to be very high or somewhat uncontrolled. A good example of this may be when there's only a single provider of a product and service in the marketplace. You have something called a single point of failure, but you don't have any options. Your organization has two choices, A, to accept the risk, or B, not use that product or service. So in most cases, they just might accept the risk. Now we can talk about transferring some of that risk or more accurately, insuring against loss, right? Because we're not alleviating the risk, but we are moving some of the financial liability to an insurance carrier or to another vendor, right? So if something goes wrong, we're not bearing the full financial burden. We do this through making sure that the vendor has the right insurance, that we have the right insurance, or you know, really paying attention to indemnification and limits of liability within our contract. But then that brings us to mitigating uh, through implementing controls. Now controls basically come in two flavors. There's preventative controls, which are in place to prevent unwanted events from happening, right? We can require authorization, we can have separation of duties, uh, you know, maintaining good cybersecurity, and we also have detective controls, which are controls that are put in place to help us identify when something has gone wrong. So this would be doing a review, taking an inventory, uh, conducting a test, etc. 
So I want to just take a quick pause and talk about controls a bit more, just because we always have a wide variety of participants in our boot camp. And I just want to make sure everyone has a good working knowledge and is on the same page when we're talking about controls. So essentially, controls are a combination of people or processes and tools that are put in place to prevent, detect, or correct issues caused by unwanted events. So when you talk about mitigating controls, we can talk about internal or external controls. So some examples of having an internal control might be requiring a separation of duties. So a person approving an expense account is not the same one writing the check. Or we might have things like a financial transaction review by two separate people so that we don't have any fraud or error. You know, biometric screening um, to keep unauthorized persons out of sensitive workspaces, access management, those kind of things are all examples of controls. Uh, as a working example, let's say that we are hiring a vendor to perform some debt collection on our behalf and they run a customer uh, call center. We have a lot of potential risk in this activity. We have a lot of regulatory risk. We have customer uh, satisfaction. We might um, have them processing uh, payments on our behalf. So there's a lot of risk that would require some control. So one of the things that we can do is make sure that the customer service agents are very well trained um, in the regulations, in issue remediation, and appropriate messaging so that we can address some of those regulatory and customer satisfaction issues. We would want to make sure that they're PCI certified so that all of those credit card payments are handled appropriately. Those are all examples of controls. Now that we're having this conversation, you might be thinking about controls in terms of your organization or your vendors. And while you're thinking about that, it is time for a poll. Jesse. Our second poll question of the day is, our organization has a formal and documented risk acceptance process. Yes, no, one is in development, or you're unsure. Hillary, I have another question here that we could go ahead and answer. Okay. And this, question, this question is, who is supposed to complete the inherent risk assessment? Okay, so the inherent risk assessment should always, if possible, be completed by the vendor owner or the person in your organization who is seeking to bring that vendor on board. Now the reason for this is, is that that inherent risk assessment is really asking a lot of questions about the product and service, and we really need the person who knows the most about it to answer those questions so they're answered accurately. So whenever possible and as a best practice, make sure that vendor owner is the one completing that risk assessment. I hope that helps. Great. Thanks, Hillary. We have about 45 seconds left on our open poll questions, so please get those responses in. If you have any issues submitting your poll question, please send us a message via the Ask Question widget and we will be happy to assist. You can also add any questions there that you may have throughout the session. And we're down to about 20 seconds left on our poll question. Please go ahead and get those responses in soon. We will be closing in just about 10 seconds. Thank you. Okay, here are those results. Thanks again, everyone, for taking the time to answer the poll. Before continuing, I would like to direct your attention to our How to Mitigate Third-Party Risk infographic available for download in the Related Content widget. As we just discussed mitigating controls, you may find this resource helpful. Okay, Hillary, back to you. <laughs> 
All right, so now we understand inherent risk rating and the application of controls, we can really start talking about residual risk, which considers how effective all those controls really are. So just to quickly recap, first we conduct the inherent risk assessment and calculate the risk rating. We determine if that vendor is critical or not, and we align our due diligence requirements against that risk rating and criticality and the types of risk presented in the engagement. We review all the vendor's information and their evidence of controls to determine how confident we are in those controls. Now we can determine that residual risk score or the level of risk that there is after controls have been applied. Let's look at a little working example about how inherent and residual risk actually work. I like to use this little visual of the scale. So let's say for this vendor engagement, we require 24-7 operations, and the vendor is providing a product and service where they have to be licensed in their individual states to perform that service. They also are taking credit card payments, so they access and process and store PII and um, are providing transactions on our behalf. And as we identify the specific risks in our inherent risk assessment, we end up with a pretty high risk rating. And those risks are assessed and rated, of course, before we think about any of the controls. So you can see that the risks are pretty substantial. It's a high risk engagement. But as we go through due diligence, we discover that the vendor does have some pretty effective specific controls in place. So, for example, that operational risk, that 24-7 service is supported by really thorough and tested business continuity plans. So we know if there's a business interruption, they should be able to handle it and maintain that level of service. The compliance risk is balanced out by the fact that the vendor does have all the current licenses for all the jurisdictions where they do business, and the vendor's been able to prove that they're PCI certified, so they know they have a standard level of control around taking credit card payments. We also have reviewed their SOC 2 Type 2 report and see that they have a very satisfactory cybersecurity environment. So when we look at these controls, they're going to counterbalance some of that risk, which means the remaining risk of the engagement is somewhere closer to the moderate level of risk. So let's consider some residual risk variants. So let's assume that your inherent risk was high, and after due diligence was conducted, it still is really high. In this situation, we should stop and review because we need to understand if it's possible to add more or different controls to reduce that risk. You know, maybe we need to transfer some of the financial liability if you're an insurance policy or contract terms. And in the most extreme cases, maybe there's no other choice. This is a, the only vendor available in the market. Our organization may decide to formally accept that risk. But when there's been no change between your inherent risk and your residual risk, always stop and review. So in this case, you've completed your due diligence and you see that the risk has been reduced. Your residual risk is now lower than your inherent risk. <clears throat> it's probably safe to proceed. However, it's really important to remain vigilant and keep an eye on things. So this is why we need to establish the timing of that next dose review. This is something we do periodically. We reassess the risk, we refresh that due diligence, and we stay aware of any events that can affect the third party, um, whether that's you know a cyber attack or something that's even happening in the industry. So when you consider the effectiveness of measures in place, we always look at the residual risk to evaluate if they're sufficient. But the big question is, how do you know what constitutes sufficient? Well, 
That is up to your organization because it's important for your organization to acknowledge the level of risk they're managing and determine if additional or alternative controls are necessary to ensure that acceptable risk thresholds are maintained. Now, I want to clarify something very important at this point. Residual risk should not be considered as a risk rating, meaning that moderate risk rating never replaces your inherent risk rating of high. Residual risk is a measure of control effectiveness. Now, why is this important? Because when it comes to risk, organizations have to determine what they are willing to accept. That means deciding how much risk appetite they have, you know, whether they're willing to operate in a high-risk environment where incidents are more likely, or if they prioritize a higher level of security with less risk involved. So you have to use your residual risk score very wisely. And remember that it's a tool to help your organization decide if the vendor engagement is within your risk tolerance. Please. Do not use your residual risk rating to set your monitoring schedule or determine due diligence because that's just an audit or an exam finding just waiting to happen. All right, just to recap how we use residual risk ratings in our program, the first one is just to determine if enough risk has been mitigated and if it's acceptable or if it isn't, then what else do we need to do to get it within our risk appetite? We also use residual risk to reflect our organization's confidence in the controls based on the results of our due diligence. And residual risk can help us identify the most risky relationships so that we can manage them accordingly. We also can use residual risk to demonstrate the overall effectiveness of our program. If we have a lot of high inherent risk and we can show that we've reduced it through those applications of controls, monitoring, that means our program's working as it should. Now, just to remember, residual risk can never be used to establish your risk management, monitoring rigor, or any routine for vendor relationship. That has to be based on the inherent risk. So while you're absorbing that, it's time for our last poll of this session. Jesse. Our next poll question is, does your organization utilize residual risk scoring as part of your current third-party risk management process? Yes, somewhat, no, or you are unsure? Hillary, let's go ahead and answer another question from the audience. Let's do it. Great. Should a fourth party be considered in the third-party risk rating? Uh, this is kind of a complicated question, but it's a really good one. So the first thing to remember is that when it comes to fourth parties, it's up to your direct third party to manage those relationships. And so, for example, let's say they have a fourth party that is a single point of failure, meaning there's no one else that can replace them. And that fourth party is critical to your vendor in providing that product or service. That definitely should be factored into the overall risk of the engagement, but it may not be something that you discover during the inherent risk assessment itself because generally we're focusing on that product or service. So while we are looking at a risk rating that evolves from that third party, you know, that inherent risk assessment. Those fourth parties may not always show up, but we will discover that more as we go through due diligence. And it could affect the risk rating. It may mean that you have additional controls that you need to watch, additional monitoring. In any case, in a situation like that, you're probably going to be higher critical, and that's going to require the most monitoring anyway. So um, it's a good thing to keep in mind, but it may not always show up right in your inherent risk rating. I hope that made sense. Here are those results. Thank you to everyone for answering this question, as it's always interesting to see what everyone says. As a reminder, in the related content widget, 
you will find our How to Review Third-Party Risk with Vendor Risk Assessments eBook. This ebook discusses vendor risk assessment in terms of the process and vendor risk assessment in terms of a document. Hillary, we're ready to continue with the presentation. So while it's great to establish that initial inherent and residual risk, it's also really important to keep in mind that risk is constantly changing and evolving. So if you look at your vendor risk management lifecycle chart, You'll see that you know we do this initial risk assessment in that onboarding stage, but we also need to do it throughout the rest of the life cycle. That's why we need to ensure that that inherent risk is periodically reassessed during ongoing. And to give you a quick overview of how we begin this process, we just have that line of business or vendor owner confirm that nothing has changed with the relationship. And that means opening up the most current inherent risk assessment and validating that all of the answers are essentially still the same. Once we can validate the risk is the same, then you need to reach out to the vendor to make sure that the due diligence documents you have in file are the most current and that the answers provided in their last questionnaire remain unchanged. Of course, if there are new or different risks present, you may need to collect additional new information and documentation from the vendor and complete a new vendor risk review. So let's wrap up with some key takeaways for this session. First of all, when it comes to inherent risk, assessments are always internal documents. They're completed by the vendor owner, never the vendor. And they're asking questions about the product and service and therefore the relationship. And what we're Assessing is that raw or untreated risk, right? We're not considering any controls at this point. We use our inherent risk assessments and their ratings to determine how we're going to manage that relationship. That includes all the risk management practices such as risk reassessment, due diligence, risk and performance monitoring, et cetera. And we use the inherent risk assessment to determine how we're going to treat that vendor throughout the relationship. Now, when it comes to residual risk, we can only figure that out after due diligence has been completed. And we use it to determine if the risk treatment or the controls are acceptable enough to get that risk within our risk appetite. We can never use residual risk to determine the vendor risk management requirements or routines. And Due diligence is necessary to identify and verify risk mitigation controls. So we can't really figure out residual risk without completing our due diligence. And of course, periodic risk reassessment and updated due diligence are essential throughout the lifetime of the relationship. And how often you do that really depends on the risk of the engagement. And with that, I hope this session has been helpful. I'm gonna turn it back over to Jesse for more Q&A. Great, thanks so much, Hillary, for the informative session. Before we move on to our next session, where Greg will discuss vendor due diligence, we're going to take a quick break. Please meet us back right here at the top of the hour. You do not need to close out and log back in. Just simply leave everything as is.
Welcome back, everyone. We are now going to move into our next session, which is Steps and Strategies of Vendor Due Diligence. Vendor due diligence occurs in the onboarding stage of the third-party risk management lifecycle since initial due diligence should be done before signing a vendor contract. Vendor due diligence also occurs in the ongoing stage of the life cycle because ongoing due diligence is performed throughout the relationship. Again, you can refer to the full life cycle that is below the slides area on your screen. We'll now be hearing from Greg Cameron, Head of Third-Party Risk Advisory. Greg, the floor is yours. All right, well, let's start with the agenda. We'll dive into what vendor due diligence is why it's important, where it is in the life cycle, some fundamental concepts of how it's performed. Then we'll go a little bit deeper. We'll look at risk-based vendor due diligence, how this should be driven by something, how it's prescriptive and very targeted in nature. We'll look at documentation and what can be collected depending on risk factors and what's triggered. We'll look at what to do when you can obtain information. Not everything's gonna go perfectly. You have to have an understanding of the options there. And we'll wrap up this segment with key takeaways. Well, due diligence is one of the most important activities in the entire life cycle. It directly follows your risk assessment. So you should have an understanding of that baseline inherent risk. What's been triggered there? What are the categories and to what extent those categories are factor? So you're going to into due diligence having been informed and influenced by that. It's going to be conducted for both new engagements and then periodically for existing engagements. You want to continue to review. Um, you don't want to assume everything is good just because you looked at it two years ago, right? So there's the initial due diligence effort, as well as an ongoing effort. At a very high level, you're looking at the vendor's controls. This is done by questionnaires, it's by reviewing evidence, and it's by having conversations directly with the vendor themselves. Controls are risk mitigants. A business continuity control, for example. A cyber program is a control. You want to make sure that you're identifying it, that it's in place, it's evidenced, and that you have an understanding that it's successful. You don't want to just look at it at face value, that there's the, you know, it's on paper. You want to understand that it's been implemented and it's very successful. So through this effort, you then have an understanding of how those controls reduce your risk, and then you have visibility to your overall residual risk, if that's something that you're calculating. Residual risk is always going to be less than or equal to your inherent risk. Ideally, it's going to be less than because you've reviewed these controls. You have an understanding of how that inherent risk has been reduced. So why is it important? Well, very important. You want to make sure that you're comfortable moving forward if this is a new vendor into the contract phase. Uh, you want to be educated here. You don't want to be blind to the relationship that you're getting into. It is very much a requirement um, in the regulatory space, so be mindful of that. You want to overall identify if there's any gaps or weaknesses in controls. It might be a situation where it's an absolute no-go. You don't have confidence and you don't want to move forward with this vendor. It might be a situation where, okay, we'll move forward, but let's add some additional contract clauses to make sure that they're, for example, maybe going to retest um, in 30 or 60 days and to make us a little bit more comfortable feeling um, following due diligence. Or it might be that everything goes perfectly. You've reviewed their controls, there are no weaknesses, and you're in a position and it, you're, you've been informed and, and you have that visibility that the vendor has the right controls in place. So it really sets you up with an understanding of who it is you're get, going into business with. What is this relationship gonna look like? Um, and gives you that 
uh, comfortable feeling as you move forward into the contracting phase. So as we've mentioned, in addition to it being a best practice, obviously there's a, a regulatory aspect here. This is not an exhaustive list, but certainly some of the prime targets for you to be aware of. There's a, a recently released interagency guidance on third-party relationships that goes across multiple regulatory bodies. Uh, there's HIPAA, of course, FINRA, NFA. The DOJ has um, evaluation of compliance programs, GDPR. So it's important for you to know who you're regulated by, which have influence in your program, and what are the requirements there. Uh, you'll see language that it's going to be risk-based, and that's the best practice. Having been informed by risk, you know, to what extent you need to perform due diligence, what is the type of scrutiny that you need to, to um, in, enact, and then the frequency, how often you're actually going to be performing that review. So be familiar with those requirements, build that into your program to be able to do that consistently. So here are some fundamental concepts to walk away with. Due diligence looks at not just the vendor itself and the organization, but it, the product and service in particular. It's very common for specific to contr uh, controls to be around the product and service. So I'll make an example in the IT space. The specific IT product might have a specific data center, not the global headquarters, or data center B, it's supported by data center A on the vendor site. So that's the control that you're going to be evaluating, product specific to the data center that's housing the, the, the software that you might be using as a customer. So remember, it's not just at the vendor level, it's very much at the product service level in question. Overall, it's looking at the sufficiency of the vendor's controls. This, as mentioned, is going to be influenced by your risk assessment. You're not going to be asking a marketing company what their software support is like, right? It has to be product and service specific, and you should be informed of what are the risks that are triggered. So you're asking and scrutinizing the right controls. It is based very much on the complexity um, as well as the risks. So overall, in terms of cadence, the higher the risk, uh, the more rigorous and the more frequency behind your due diligence effort. You should really put a schedule together. Um, you should be looking at repeating the highest risk on an annual basis would be our recommendation. Do you have to do moderate or lower risks annually? Probably not, but you do want to have the confidence in your risk assessment so that you can implement that, that schedule um, and then follow that moving forward. In terms of strategies, really important that there is a variety of ways to perform due diligence, and these can be done in combination. Questionnaires like the Shared Assessments SIG, or Standard Infor Information Gathering, uh, or your own custom questionnaires. They can be sent out to the vendor, so you're getting direct responses from the vendor. Typically, yes is a no's, with potentially commentary for any time that there's, there's a no or a, an unintended type of response. Documentation or the evidence. This is in the form of policies and plans and testing evidence. There might be overviews um, or, or summaries that are presented. It's going to come in a variety of ways across the evidence space. Direct conversation with key stakeholders that might be um, uh, in person on sites, or it might be over, you know, webinars and um, Zoom calls, right? But the combination here gives you the visibility to the particular programs and the particular controls that you want more information behind, and ultimately that's the fundamental concept here that we're after for due diligence. Well, here we can start to get a sense of what some actual baseline documentation to collect. This is in addition to any questionnaires that might be sent out. 
These are typically sent out to all of your vendors. Uh, some organizations call this a vetting process. And it's still due diligence, but it's, it's very much um, a baseline. More often than not, these are at the vendor level to get a sense of who the vendor is, where they're operating from, and that you do want to move forward with a deeper dive of, of risk-based due diligence following this. So let's take a look at this list. You want to get a sense of where they're working from, their headquarters, where they're incorporated, do they have the right licenses? Is there any issues at the Office of Foreign Agents? Um, you might do a politically exposed person check. Um, so, you know, background checks, uh, Better Business Bureau, uh, Dun & Bradstreet reports are great. Look at vendor complaints. Look at customer reviews. Um, look at negative news. Right? There's a lot of free resources there to get a sense of who they are in the market, who their competitors are, um, and, and their overall reputation. You might look at pictures um, on Google Maps, view their facility. Uh, there's a lot of visibility there, which is great. Overall, this is a good baseline document collection to, uh, to build into your program before we start getting into risk-based um, evidence requests. So on this slide, we have a little bit deeper dive now, and we're going into collection for critical vendors or those with elevated risk. In the subsequent slides, we will have really prescriptive risk-based uh, evidence lists. But this is a good high-level summary of more targeted uh, evidence requests beyond that initial vetting uh, background check type of evidence. So more often than not with critical vendors, you want to be sending um, a questionnaire. Critical vendors, you're going to be engaging on an annual basis. You want to hear directly from them. Uh, it's really important to uh, take the deepest dive with that, with that list. A lot of our customers have a, a a body or a board or a committee that approves critical vendors, right? And this is your the, the, the top of your list and, and that percentage of your overall portfolio that you care the most about. Um, biggest impact to your organization if, if there's any failures or disruptions. So look at questionnaires, look at policies and procedures. These are going to be um, across all different risk domains. Um, audited financial statements, get a sense of what's going on in that space. SOC uh, 1, SOC 2, other independent third-party audit reports. This gives you a great visibility to what's going on in, in the space of your critical vendor. Business continuity, disaster recovery, pandemic, always for critical vendors. By definition, you are highly reliant on these critical vendors, and there's a big impact uh, or put, there's potential for impact upon disruption. So availability and security um, of staff, of data, of technology, all of that should, is, you know, by default um, in scope for your critical vendors. Look at regulatory findings, any enforcement actions, litigations, judgments. Um, if you're an organization that requires it, you can get into environmental, social, and governance aspects, ESG, that's becoming more and more present. Um, so look for those uh, disclosures and, uh, and reporting if, if that's applicable. Here's the next poll question. How do you track compliance to your organization's due diligence schedule? We run reports against completed tasks. Vendor owners are on an honor system. We don't track for internal compliance. We only look if there is an issue with the vendor or not sure. Greg, while we wait for the results to tabulate, we can answer a question from the audience. And this question is, can one person review all documents? OK, uh, not typically, no. You have to remember that the higher the risk, the more areas have been triggered. Uh, 
the more topics or control domains there are. So you're going to find it challenging to find one person to be a subject matter expert across all of these, especially when it comes to technology and cyber. There are some very nuanced artifacts that require experience and, and technical uh, perspective in order to review. So what we recommend is, is really take an inventory of who on your side can support document reviews, ensure they're available when vendors are engaged and, and sending over evidence. Uh, it's pretty sensible to remove single points of failure so you have multiple folks um, it, it, and you have that bench strength and multiple subject matter experts for any given topic to really avoid that unavailability and then potentially it's delays on your side in that review process. So hopefully that's some helpful thoughts. Okay, everyone, here are those results. Thank you for submitting your responses. Before we move on, I would like to share that in our related content widget, you'll find our seven steps of risk-based vendor due diligence infographic and matrix available for download. Be sure, to, be sure to check out this handy resource. Back to you, Greg. So now here's different ways to conduct due diligence based on risk. We've already talked about a baseline set of vetting and that background check at the organizational level. We talked about a baseline list for critical vendors. As we get into the risk space, there is actually two methodologies, and both of these are still risk-based due diligence. Just one is more detailed and uh, granular than the other. So if we look at based on risk ratings, you might have three different due diligence efforts there. You might have a, a low and a moderate and a high risk due diligence um, process in place. And that means that it's, it's, you're going to be sending um, consistent evidence and or questionnaires to the low, moderate, and high risk vendors, but there are potentially some areas of that that are not in scope for that particular product and service. And that's okay. Uh, questionnaires and even evidence requests allow for your vendor to say, you know what, this, this area is not relevant for us, right? So it might be a marketing company that says, we're not a data center provider, you know, it's not applicable for that, those types of questions. That's okay, but you just wanna be mindful of that, that this effort is, is sort of a, um, a simple approach, often uh, for, for younger, more, growing organizations that want to get off the ground, want to do consistent due diligence, um, but maybe don't have enough experience yet to do it based on inherent risk, which is the next option. This is much more targeted, more specific, uh, much more influenced on the specific inherent risk types that have been triggered, so the categories or domains that have been triggered by your inherent risk uh, assessment itself. So the, the, the next set of slides, we'll look at both of these. And if you're a company thinking about due diligence for the first time or setting up your program, you can, you can kind of do a comparison of what might make sense for you. So here we're presenting some document collection items based on risk at the moderate level. So for low, it's all the items in the baseline document collection that have already been presented. That's enough for low risk. As we look at moderate, well, here's where we want to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, financials, they're not necessarily foundational. You can get a quick overview or a quick status um, from Dun & Bradstreet, but you might want to go a little bit deeper and request a financial review. That becomes more important here for moderate risk. Uh, insurance certificates um, could be cyber in nature, could be operational in nature. Uh, compliance policies, your vendor's third-party risk management practices, very important. As the risk increases, 
you have to be mindful that you have fourth parties. Your vendors have vendors. So look at your vendors' third-party risk management. What are they doing? Are they performing due diligence like you're, you're learning about here today? Stock reports, again, bridge, bridge letters if necessary, depending on the, uh, the date stamp. Reports from internal and external auditors. Anti-money laundering is, in, um, is important here. InfoSec and um, record retention, data destruction. You get into cyber as you get into moderate. Background checks for their personnel, their hiring practices. If it's a staff-related or staff-reliant um, product or service, you want to get into the staff. Uh, in terms of how they're hiring, who they are, and the availability of their, of their staff themselves. And now to round out the due diligence at overall inherent risk rating, we have, we have high-risk vendors. It's going to be all the items for low and moderate, plus an add-on here, a little bit deeper. Um, an extension to the overall list of what's been requested. You might continue to look at bio biographies um, and an understanding of ownership um, and board members of the organization. Uh, you could go deeper into the cyber aspect and logical access management, data classification and handling. Um, is there personal information at hand? Is there non-public information? Um, so a deeper dive into those um, data handling policies are important. Incident management, how do they handle incidents? Whether it's cyber or operational uh, disruptions, what do they do there? Um, do they have a team? Are they going to let you know um, and communicate with you as a customer as they're going through a specific incident? Very important. Availability becomes even more important here. Um, even if they're not a critical vendor, they're high risk. Let's look at business continuity. Let's look at disaster recovery, plans, protocols, test results. Um, it's really important that they don't, they don't just have a policy in place, but that they are actually evidencing that they've implemented these programs and that they're testing them. So for BCDR, pandemic, Look at beyond policies. Look at plans and protocols, standards, program materials, and testing results. Really important there. Similar on the cyber aspect, there's penetration tests. They can perform them themselves. There might be a third party performing penetration tests and vulnerability testing. Uh, you might engage your IT team to, to really scrutinize their network diagrams and their resiliency there, failover uh, between data centers and uh, data flow between these data centers and, and all of that. Um, continue to look at third party and fourth parties there and how they might be outsourcing themselves. Then a lot of our vendors use Amazon Web uh, Services, right, AWS. That's a fourth party if, you're, if your vendor is housed there. So look at that relationship as it relates to uh, data flow and availability. There, you also might consider an on-site visit where you're maybe not doing that for low risk or moderate risk. For high risk, you might want to send some of your IT staff or your compliance officer um, or even your business continuity team to look at the resiliency and the controls firsthand on, on site, in person. Well, the next four or five slides now change from due diligence based on overall risk level to specific triggered inherent risk. The categories, domains that have been triggered and to what extent do they need to be scrutinized. This particular um, list is for your critical vendors. That's often a high reliance, high impact, short recovery time objective or, you know, de short dependency as a customer in terms of their uh, overall recovery ability. So with those factors and having um, that relationship to a higher impact 
these are specific control areas that you want to scrutinize, and then the associated due diligence items that give you visibility to those controls. So you're concerned about their ability to communicate, their established service level agreements, and monitoring those being delivered. Your business continuity is, of course, triggered. Um, it's the vendor's ability to recover and your own ability to have an internal control if there is a disruption. Um, that control is on both sides of the house. Disaster recovery on the vendor side. Are they protecting their data and their availability of technology uh, through disaster recovery programs? Human resources, very much a control area to scrutinize. Compliance, and then of course, vendor risk management. Your critical vendors, more often than not, will have vendors themselves. So those become critical fourth parties at that point. You want to understand that your critical vendor has a, uh, a strong third-party risk management program in place. So on the right side, here are your related due diligence items based on those control areas having been triggered by the fact that there is high impact to you as a customer because they're a critical vendor. You get into the planning and testing evidence, certifications, of course, audit reports. Um, you can get the list of critical vendors and ideally um, a policy or an overview or a sense of their vendor risk management or, or third-party risk management program itself. So in the same fashion, here we have a specific risk of hosting or storing sensitive information. So obviously the control areas are around security, information security. Uh, of course, human resources, because their staff are going to be engaging and controlling and managing that important information. Uh, privacy, compliance, again, vendor risk management, that's a theme that really doesn't go away. Um, and financial health. Your due diligence items that are specific uh, and are triggered by those controls because the vendor has hosted or, or is storing sensitive information then is, again, certifications or proof of regulatory compliance, associated policies and procedures around InfoSec and HR and, and data privacy, SOC 2 Type 2, SOC 2 being um, more on the security and resiliency availability aspect, Type 2 being um, over time, so you get a, a better uh, sense of how they're operating through that SOC 2, uh, vulnerability and penetration testing, proof of the vendor risk management um, program in place, privacy policy, and financials. So here we say uh, the, the risk of directly interacting with customers or clients. Very common inherent risk question and a very important one as well. You can see here that just because they're speaking or directly interacting with customers, there are specific controls that you want to make sure that are in place. Their reputation, again, human resources and background checking. Who are these folks that are going to be interacting and engaging with your customer base? their ability to control privacy throughout their, their staff uh, and any information shared in general, their ability to, to continue to be compliant and their evidence there, their audit, uh, risk management protocols, and then again, vendor risk management. Um, it might be fourth parties that are directly interacting with uh, your customers, or it might be a fourth party um, software or um, other products that support the vendor's ability to directly interact with your customers. The vendor risk management, again, very important here. So in terms of your due diligence items based on this specific risk, this is where we get into um, continue to look at policies and procedures across the control areas that have been triggered. You could look at privacy policy and any applicable certifications, proof of regulatory compliance. Um, 
we'll, we'll add to this list the, the third-party risk management um, program or, or evidence that that's in place as well. Well, next up, we have another very common inherent risk that might be triggered, and that's physical access to facilities. These are consultants um, and might be um, IT support staff, others that come onto your own premise and have potentially unescorted access. Those mitigating controls are going to be on both sides. So important for you to have the visibility of this through inherent risk so that you can tell your own physical you know, security team or facilities or HR that these staff uh, members from your vendor are going to be there, right? And they can set up their own internal communications and protocols there to make sure that those staff are informed about how to uh, behave properly. On the vendor side, obviously, you, you want to continue to scrutinize their ability to hire appropriate staff that have been trained and, and have um, history of behaving well and are um, compliant and that there's a monitoring effort behind this training and compliance on the vendor side. You might be looking at privacy um, and uh, contractual SLAs there. So you can monitor um, and, and look at contractual obligations by the vendor to hire appropriate staff, keep them compliant, um, and, uh, and have that control in place in terms of, a, of, of your contract. Due diligence items, list, list of employees who are going to be granted access. Um, obviously, by name, that's so important to, to know exactly who the controlled list of um, vendor staff members will be. Evidence of privacy and compliance training, as we've talked about, and any other associated policies and procedures. But unescorted physical access is a very important inherent risk question to look at, and if triggered, this is the risk-based specific um, uh, control areas and due diligence items to, to scrutinize. And last up for uh, specific inherent risk-based due diligence, we have significant cost. Uh, we know that for some organizations, this is actually a criticality factor. Uh, for others, it's not, but it is a risk. Um, Significant costs means that it might be more challenging to implement an alternate vendor. Um, might be greater impact there. So look at your own ability to uh, continue operations, maybe absorb the, this particular product or service in-house, and, and how long can you do that for? Or if there is an alternate vendor being able to make that transition, that's an internal control, right, that availability. On the vendor side, we're looking at service level agreements, um, their financial health, um, making sure that the vendor with significant cost is um, has good standing and looks like they're going to be around for the foreseeable future. So, as always, for due diligence items, we're looking at certifications and, and regulatory compliance associated policies and procedures across um, business continuity and availability, um, BOC 2 Type 2 report, and financials. The next poll question is, do you feel you have enough subject matter experts or SME support for thorough due diligence? Yes, we do internally. Yes, but we outsource some due diligence. No, we need more SME support, or you're not sure. Greg, we have another question from the audience that we can answer. Okay. What if we can't gather some documentation from vendors? Sure. Well, you should be prepared for this scenario. It's going to happen. You're not always going to get everything you request, and it's not always going to go smoothly. So the first sort of decision tree for you to consider is whether this is a complete roadblock for you for due diligence um, in, in completing due diligence, or is this documentation way down in your list in terms of priority and overall what was requested, and you can still move forward um, in its absence. 
In terms of alternate methods for direct document gathering, they might want to share with you in person. That might be their preference uh, if it's a certain type of material. Um, you could certainly try to request a, an online conference or webinar. Maybe that's something that will get you around them not sharing it. Um, or potentially you could have your own on-site, right? You could go visit them and maybe they're more comfortable and you can scrutinize whatever area that you need to look at um, on-site. Now, if they're not willing to accommodate your request at all, you should really document that um, for existing vendors as an issue. In fact, they might be um, non-compliant with their contract. If you have a customer right to audit and they're not sending you what you asked for, then that's a situation you need to not only uh, submit a, an issue um, and formally document it, but probably escalate to legal and see if they're, they need to contact the vendor um, through that, those channels. But less, you know, if this is a new vendor and you're asking for his documentation and they don't want to send it to you, then maybe that's your indication that they're not the best partner um, and maybe not the best choice. So especially as you're comparing multiple vendors, that might give you, um, you know, the justification to go in a different direction with a different vendor at that point. So thanks, Jesse. Okay, here are those results. Thanks again, everyone, for taking the time to answer the poll. And before we move on, please be aware that our Ways to Improve Vendor Document Collection Efficiency Infographic is within the related content widget. Greg, back to you. Well, it's worth repeating about collecting fourth-party risk documentation. You saw that regardless of your methodology, whether that's triggered by overall risk or triggered by specific inherent risk domains, fourth party risk is going to be commonly triggered. Um, it's really not going away. We all use more and more vendors. So too do our vendors themselves. So it is a, it's a one-to-many relationship for every vendor. You're gonna have many more fourth parties. It's important to know how to do this consistently um, and comprehensively. It starts with conversation with your vendor. Who are your critical vendors? Let us know who you're using. Uh, you're gonna request that uh, through early conversations. You could ask through an RFP, you could ask right up through the contracting phase. Um, getting, you know, right from the horse's mouth. Who are those those vendors, the critical vendors that you're your third party is going to be um, utilizing. Contractually, you can actually obligate your vendor to let you know when those critical vendors are changing. Um, there's a risk associated to that, at, you know, a downstream risk. You as a customer, if your vendor is changing their critical vendors, so you can let them know you're concerned about that um, and you want to make sure that you have visibility when they make those decisions. Obviously, re reviewing their overall third-party risk management program is important. Um, regardless of who their vendors are, knowing that they're doing the right things, that they're actually contracting with their vendors appropriately, performing due diligence appropriately, monitoring appropriately, that's so important. So if you don't get evidence um, or a, a, a vendor list, uh, vendor names themselves, just looking at their program at least gives you visibility to the ability, their control of third-party risk management. Um, now last, you might be able to see the list of third parties if they have a SOC 2. Um, SSAE actually requires those to be listed, so that's an opportunity. It really depends on which areas have been triggered for that SOC 2 um, beyond security. So it'll be interesting to see that as well. Keep that um, at the top of mind. So we talked about the what and the how. It's, it is time to talk about the who. Subject matter experts' role in due diligence is so important. You will be, you will find it challenging to find one person that is an expert across all the different areas that we've talked about. 
information security and privacy, business continuity, disaster recovery, pandemic, HR, financials. You should be considering not just the how and the when, but the who is going to be performing this on your side. Subject matter experts can be internal, external. You, you can, of course, outsource due diligence. But they should be tasked with reviewing the questionnaires, the evidence, and having the conversations with the vendors. So regardless of the strategy, your SMEs should be involved and giving you the feedback that you need about the controls being scrutinized. If they see uh, concerns, that's where you need to hear directly from your SMEs. It might be a no-go with the vendor. It might be let's put in some internal uh, controls on our side in our contract. It might be other internal controls, like let's strengthen our own business continuity plan in the event that there's a disruption. They should have significant experience across that particular area so they can give you the sound feedback and support the control review, the overall due diligence effort. Well, we mentioned it earlier, but you're going to be faced with challenges. You should expect it. In fact, we know, based on evidence from our participants in our annual white paper, that that's one of the most common challenges, right? Um, the amount of time it takes is going to vary. Not everyone's going to overnight everything that you're, you're looking for. Uh, some are more unresponsive than others, of course, but the time is something that you need to build in in terms of a buffer. Vendors may not provide everything that you're looking for. Um, there might be unanswered questionnaires. There might be evidence that's omitted from your request. Vendor controls, of course, might not be established or might show weaknesses. We'll talk more about that and your reliance on subject matter experts to get that perspective. Um, of course, performing due diligence at the vendor level is a challenge. You want to go deeper, go into the product and service level. Lack of a centralized repository is a challenge, not being able to find historical evidence um, or having multiple subject matter experts on your side um, review the same information. So, uh, you know, availability of the evidence that you're requesting is so important on your side. And internal subject matter experts or the staff that are supporting this process, they're not availability, this whole process pauses. Be prepared for these common challenges. And of course, in the forthcoming slides, we'll talk about some tips, tricks, and solutions. Well, here we have our tips and tricks. We've sprinkled a lot of these throughout the slides, but all in one page here, really strong list to be mindful of. Ask for everything you need up front. This saves time. This allows your vendor to be organized and send things out in one request. You might not get it back in piecemeal. Um, the more you're organized on your side, the better ability your vendor has to be organized and, and responding to you. Um, have a sense of your own priority. Know where there's wiggle room in terms of your own requests. Uh, document your attempts, right? As you've had those challenges, um, the lack of evidence, the, the, the controls not being strong enough, or the lack of a response, Document that, especially for existing vendors. They might not be um, compliant with your contract at that point, right? If, if you have the customer right to audit and they're not responding back to you, that's an issue. Um, they're, not, that's, they're not meeting a contractual obligation at that point. So document your, your requests. Uh, set a schedule. Stay organized. Uh, escalate as needed. Make sure you have buy-in from your committees and your boards and your different um, other stakeholders for these challenges that are occurring. Uh, consider site visits or direct interviews in, in lieu of evidence that's, um, that's not being requested. Make sure you have your subject matter experts in place. Make sure they know what they're reviewing. Um, perhaps they can cross-train so that there is high availability of those subject matter experts. Ask them to give you a sense of what controls are not strong and what we should do about them. What do we do in our contracts? What, what can we ask for in the future if, um, if there are known weaknesses? 
um, stick to your process, make sure you're doing things consistently, and um, and hopefully this, this allows you to um, avoid these challenges that uh, we know we're going to face. We are to the last poll question of the day. And this question is, how do you handle any issues experienced in conducting due diligence, such as lack of vendor evidence or poor vendor controls? We require a formal issue ticket to be submitted to then manage the situation. We handle this on a case-by-case -case basis. We don't have an issue process. We never have issues, or you're not sure. Greg, I have another question here from the audience that we can't answer. How do I figure out who my fourth parties are? Yeah, great question. Uh, first and foremost, one way is to simply ask your vendors, uh, whether it's through conversations within an RFP and those initial conversations, or right up through the contracting stage. Who is material to the product service in question? Who are your vendors? Um, who are your critical vendors? These are the questions as a customer or future customer you should be posing. In terms of uh, due diligence documentation and evidence, you might see the list of vendors in the SOC 2. There's some variation there. Um, not all SOC 2s are the same. Um, there's some, some options there. So while, while security uh, will always be there, there are some variation into the extent that the SOC 2 goes. So that is an option you might see um, fourth parties disclosed there. Um, contractually, you can certainly obligate vendors uh, to tell you when their critical list or material list of vendors is changing in the future. Um, so that's definitely a, a safeguard and, a, and a, good, a good effort to find out who fourth parties are on a moving forward basis. Um, the other piece of this um, is including third-party risk management as a due diligence area. How well does your vendor manage their vendors is the control that you're looking at and you're scrutinizing. So even without fourth-party names of companies, this is still going to give you a sense of the control, of how they're, they're performing third-party risk management. So you might consider that uh, once fourth parties are confirmed as being present. Thanks, Jesse. Here are those results. Thank you to everyone for answering this question. By the way, within the related content widget, you will find our How to Do Vendor Due Diligence Reviews, the complete breakdown ebook. As we have discussed a lot about vendor due diligence, this resource gives you the complete breakdown of how to do those reviews. Greg, I'll hand it back to you. Well, we wanted to offer some solutions to the earlier challenges that we mentioned. So in partnership with our tips and tricks, of course, Determine if you can accept alternative documents. Have a list of, um, you know, your your must-haves and your nice-to-haves and your alternatives uh, across every single risk category or domain. Really important to to know what your uh, priorities or your preferences are. Uh, in addition to sharing evidence directly, maybe they can present it on an online sharing platform. A lot of companies are more comfortable with that than emailing you or, or sending you sharing files to a, a platform. Have a call. Connect your SMEs to their SMEs. Um, maybe it's through, um, through that interaction that you get the evidence that you need that they have a program in place and they're doing the right thing. You could ask for redacted documentation. Um, of course, one central repository on your side, that's low-hanging fruit. If you're not organized, then that's, that's something you definitely want to work on. Uh, you know, help yourselves um, to that end. Ensure you're requesting and performing due diligence on every product and service you use, not just the vendor. We've talked about that. I mean, yeah, Vendor-level evidence is not enough. It's baseline. You want to get into the product service and the specific risks around those products and services. Um, and contractually, make sure you have that customer right to audit. That allows those future recurring due diligence efforts to go more smoothly and for you to have those legal levers and contractual clauses in place um, 
for them to be compliant to. Well, let's wrap this uh, segment with some key takeaways. We've talked about all vendors being vetted, making sure that they're in legitimate uh, good standing and, and have a structure that you're comfortable with moving forward. Uh, look at due diligence scope, should be proportionate to the risk, to your criticality, um, both in terms of how deep you dive and then how frequently you actually perform it. Make sure you have subject matter experts. One person can't do it all. Split it up and make sure that they're in, informed, involved, and uh, have experience in that particular category of, of, uh, of control that's being reviewed. If you can in, obtain information, have a backup plan, expect challenges and put a process into place so that you can be proactive and know exactly what the next step is when you run into those challenges. And last, before you move into contracting, know that contracting can be uh, influenced and is supported by due diligence, and it's not always going to be the same contract based on product or service. You might have specific clauses that you want to add that support due diligence or that speak to some of the controls that have been observed as maybe wanting a little bit um, through the due diligence process. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. Before we dive into more questions and answers, I would like to thank everyone for attending the first day of the three-day boot camp. I would also like to thank our experts from today, Hillary and Greg, for their time and sharing some important information on vendor risk and vendor due diligence. Tomorrow, VinMinder's president, Kelly Vick, will start us off by discussing vendor contracts. After Kelly's session, VinMinder's Information Security Operations Director, Lisa May Hill, will join us to discuss third-party risk management and supply chain, vendor data breaches, and vendor stock reports. Let's now go ahead and answer some more questions that have come in during this session. Okay, Hillary, this next question is for you. Okay. Is it, possible, is it possible to use previous due diligence and risk assessment results if you use the vendor for multiple services? Okay, so the important thing to remember here is that each product or service is going to bring its own set of risks. Now, that's not to say that some of the information you may have already gathered about the vendor. Uh, for example, you have a copy of their privacy policy. You might be able to reuse that or review that, provided it's current. But it's really important to not just assume that you have everything you need. So I would recommend going in and doing an inherent risk assessment at the product and service level. I would look at the due diligence requirements that come out of that, compare that to what you already have, and make sure everything is current if you are planning to reuse anything, and then request any additional information that you might need. I hope that helps. Great. Greg, we'll come over to you for this next question. Can you explain mitigating controls in more detail? Sure. So these are potential risk reducers. Controls may prevent risk from occurring. They may limit the negative impact of a risk once it has occurred. Controls can be, they can be tools, they can be operational departments, procedures, practices, uh, even contractual clauses, as you heard today. It's important to remember they can be on, uh, they exist both on the vendor side as well as your side as the customer. And so by validating that these controls exist, that they're effective, um, they can be allowed to then influence and reduce the calculated inherent risk, which as we've heard today is what we call residual risk. Thanks, Jesse. Great, thanks, Greg. Hillary, we'll hop back over to you for this question. Okay. Do you perform an OFAC check on all vendors or critical only? 
You know, it's really important to uh, do that OFAC check um, on all your vendors whenever possible. Um, there may be some cases where it, you know, it's just not practical. But remember, OFAC is to determine that there's no conflicts, there's no sanctions, um, and it's not just OFAC, it's politically exposed persons, et cetera. You just need to know that the organizations that you're doing business with are considered acceptable per the U.S. government. So I would definitely recommend running that OFAC check on everyone because um, you never know where stuff is going to pop up. There's been a lot of examples uh, even lately with a lot of the extended sanctions due to the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict that have put more people on that OFAC list. So I would advise it for everyone, not just your critical. Great. Thanks, Hillary. Greg, coming back over to you for this one. Should I request the same items for all vendors? Uh, no. So the evidence requested um, and then any questions asked should very much be tailored by uh, product service and risk as we've heard today. So an example, you wouldn't ask for the same documents and ask the same questions to a lawn uh, technician as you would your core processor who might have access to, to customer data, right? Big differences in both product and risks there. So um, vendors, their product services, it, it all should be risk rated in advance to determine which questions will be asked, which documents are appropriate to then evaluate the controls. So very much hard no, not the same for all vendors. Great. Thanks, Greg. Hillary, I think we have time for one more question. All right. What if there are multiple products and services from a single vendor and each has a different vendor owner? Who is responsible for actually managing that vendor? Mm. <laughs> this is a common situation, and it, it can be uh, kind of a complex answer. So in the past, uh, what I like to recommend is the person that has sort of the lion's share of the business or the highest risk rating um, within those products and services takes ownership. It's not always exactly clear, and this is where third-party risk management may have to go in and do a little bit of negotiation and identify someone as sort of the enterprise vendor owner, um, sort of the, the person who is the primary contact for that relationship. Now, keep in mind, all those individual vendor owners are still going to have to do the work. They're going to have to do the performance monitoring. But we do want to have sort of someone at the the top or that can represent your organization to their organization and generally that's the uh, vendor owner who has the most business who has the highest risk engagement um, to sort of coordinate and uh, manage those efforts on behalf of the organization um, i hope that's helpful thanks hillary unfortunately that is all the time we have left for questions today Thank you, Hillary and Greg, for taking the time to answer some of those that came in. Any questions we did not have time to answer today, we will address offline. We would like to thank you all for attending and hope you found today's session valuable. A big thank you to Hillary and Greg for their time and great content. You can ask even more questions inside of our third party think tank, an online community that is dedicated to third party risk professionals and free to join. Just because today's session has ended doesn't mean the conversations and questions must. Post your questions at thirdpartythinktank.com and see what your peers have to say. In the community, you'll find thousands of free educational resources related to third-party risk management topics, such as vendor risk assessments and vendor due diligence to assist you. If you'd like to become a member of Third Party Think Tank, you can register on the site or shoot us an email and we'll get you registered and send you a link to set your password. We did record today's session. And that recording link will be provided to you in a follow-up email that you will receive Friday afternoon. Also in the email will be the survey link for you to request the CPE credit. We would like to thank you all for attending and hope you found day one of the boot camp valuable. I would also like to thank Hillary and Greg for their time and content.
On behalf of Inminder, it has been a pleasure. Thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow for the second day of the boot camp.